This is Dr. Murphy with the Department of Anesthesiology at the University of Kentucky. And this is uh, the PGY3 first month cardiothoracic rotation podcast with the topic of anesthesia for aortic valve surgery. I suggest that you r read the chapter in Hensley's fifth edition before watching this podcast. In addition, from our UK basic curriculum, there is a podcast by Dr. Shell in the 2014 archive or the upcoming 2016 Block 5 um, podcasts. Now, the surgical procedures which I'm going to discuss include aortic valve replacement for aortic stenosis, aortic valve replacement for aortic regurgitation, and sub aortic resection for LVOT obstruction. Aortic valve surgery is not the same as cabbage surgery. The pathophysiology is different. Most valve lesions can be considered as either a pressure lesion or a volume lesion. Aortic stenosis is a pressure lesion. Aortic regurgitation is a lesion. This cartoon from Kaplan's sixth edition of cardiac anesthesia is meant to show the uh, pathophysiology of uh, aortic stenosis with pressure overload because of the obstruction leading to parallel replication of sarcomeres, those contractile units of myocardial function, and ultimately concentric hypertrophy of the left ventricle. This pressure volume loop shows a normal pressure volume loop and that of aortic stenosis. The arrow points to the high intracavitary pressure seen with aortic stenosis as compared to the normal uh, pressure in the left ventricle with a non-obstructive aortic valve. Also note that the diastolic pressure in aortic stenosis is elevated. There are guidelines for TEE, and this document summarizes them. And while TEE during an operation is recommended for some coronary artery surgery, it is recommended for all open heart operations including aortic valve replacement. Now let's review some of the classic standard valvular lesion parameters. First, left ventricular preload. Hensley recommends preload augmentation. That usually means volume and it usually means crystalloid. Therefore, before induction of a patient with aortic stenosis, it may be desirable to provide a, an appropriate amount of preload augmentation. Heart rate. In Hensley, low heart rates are recommended. By definition, this means heart rates of 50 to 70 beats per minute. 90 beats per minute is generally a bit fast for aortic stenosis. It is also essential to maintain some rhythm. Hensley makes the comment that beta blockade is not well tolerated. Obviously, this is not an absolute contraindication. Many patients with aortic stenosis are, all, are on beta blockers. I would interpret this to mean that caution is warranted sometimes and that the side effect of a beta blocker in someone with a severe aortic stenosis may be 
that left ventricular and diastolic volume increases and cardiac output decreases as a result. Systemic vascular resistance is usually not an issue with aortic stenosis as the afterload that the left ventricle sees is fixed and due to the valve. Reducing systemic BP does not help or improve LV function. It may reduce LV perfusion by reducing coronary perfusion pressure and impairing perfusion of the subantocardium. Pulmonary vascular resistance is only a consideration in end-stage aortic stenosis. The pre-medication should be light. Hensley makes a point of considering external defibrillator pads and my comment is that although you can't predict which patients will have cardiovascular collapse on induction, not every surgeon that I have worked with expects these to be in place. The cost is relatively small although the charge to the patient is not known and is likely to be a multiple of $20. Hensley suggests a pre-induction arterial line. I say it's only an IV in an artery and it should be uh, considered for all open heart surgery, for all cardiac patients, or any time you think you might uh, help a patient by beat to beat blood pressure monitoring, put the arterial line in before induction. Interestingly, when it comes to induction, there are there are no uh, particular recommendations in the textbook. Personally, I favor opioid induction because sufentanil and fentanyl are not negative inotropes. However, nonetheless, blood pressure can fall with induction and may require uh, treatment of a loss of sympathetic tone or excessive parasympathetic tone. Um, and such. Classically, pancuronium was paired with fentanyl. However, now that pancuronium is no longer available, I use glycopyrrolate at the time of opioid induction to offset vagal tone. Other regimens could be equally as good and with beat-to-beat -beat blood pressure monitoring during induction many anesthetic choices will be safe enough. Um, the combination of uh, ketamine and pancuronium, for example, would not be a good choice. Maintenance of anesthesia, at least according to Hensley, should be a narcotic-based anesthetic with low concentrations of volatile anesthetics being safe a pretty common way of managing uh, patients with uh, limited cardiac reserve. There is a comment about ischemia and nitroglycerin suggesting that it should be used with caution because of its effect on preload or arterial pressure. My comment is to say that before using nitroglycerin consider whether or not the patient is in heart failure or has pulmonary congestion and whether or not a reduction in preload is desirable. Myocardial ischemia could be due to inadequate coronary perfusion pressure and a vasopressor may in fact be indicated. We use PA catheters rather routinely at the University of Kentucky and Hensley makes a comment that in the absence of left bundle branch block a PA catheter could be placed. In the presence of left bundle branch block, perhaps you would consider uh, the placement of transcutaneous pacing electrodes, and, or in other words, the uh, redo pads, uh, the uh, defibrillator pads, and having an uh, external pacemaker available. The statement that the most conservative approach dictates leaving the tip of the PA catheter in a central location until the chest is open is cautious and 
uh, not difficult to uh, defend. It's, uh, it's a safe way to do things. Once the chest is opened in someone with critical air stenosis, you may uh, float the PA catheter and should it cause a life-threatening dysrhythmia, the surgeon can defibrillate the patient. Although not the be-all, end-all, the PA catheter does give you a good approximation of left atrial pressure and our SEO2 models do provide an estimate of global oxygen delivery and cardiac output. Finally, with respect to myocardial preservation, while it's not something that you have very much input on or control over, the surgeon dictates when the uh, delivery of the uh, cardioplegia and myocardial preservation uh, solutions are given. But you should be aware of the fact that the hypertrophic ventricle can be hard to uh, preserve and that uh, um, concomitant coronary artery disease could also interfere with the delivery of cardioplegia. The new valve could have a normal mean gradient as high as 20 millimeters of mercury. That is not uh, a, lot, a high gradient, but uh, some uh, ventricles uh, may be uh, depressed after bypass, and uh, even this uh, small gradient due to the normal, uh, new, due to the new valve, could be uh, some impediment to uh, um, cardiac output, stroke volume and will require uh, inotropic support. When it comes to aortic regurgitation, first ask, is it acute or chronic? This cartoon shows both, a normal uh, pressure volume loop, and to the right of it, a, an acute aortic regurgitation pressure loop with uh, a small ventricle and elevated L, uh, diastolic pressure and to the right of that a chronically dilated left ventricle from chronic aortic regurgitation. Note that in acute aortic regurgitation the left ventricular end diastolic pressure can be higher than in chronic aortic regurgitation. putting the patient into pulmonary edema. This table, which has a lot of words and numbers on it, is found in Hensley and is uh, a summary of all the qualitative and quantitative parameters used in grading aortic regurgitation by echocardiography. These uh, Photographs show cent uh, central and eccentric aortic regurgitation. However, um, the uh, primary parameters used and as mentioned in Hensley are the uh, vena contracta width and the uh, cross the percentage of uh, LVOT cross sectional area of the Patients who are undergoing surgery for aortic regurgitation usually have moderately severe um, mitral, uh, aortic regurgitation, uh, even if it's asymptomatic. I'll just uh, digress slightly here just to bring to your attention that uh, angiographic uh, uh, grading of the uh, of aortic regurgitation is done using. Uh, 1 plus to 4 plus and uh, 1 plus is uh, a, a very a mild amount of aortic regurgitation and uh, as shown in the slide uh, the uh, dye is cleared with each beat 
and increasing amounts of uh, regurgitation are, ma are manifest by increasing density of, uh, of dye on the angiogram. The surgery for aortic regurgitation is usually replacement, although some surgeons are skilled in aortic valve repair. One skilled surgeon is Dr. Tyrone David from the University of Toronto and uh, he has good results and uh, I've heard him speak and he can be critical of low volume surgeons attempting aortic uh, valve repair operations. He has developed some val aortic valve sparing operations that are named after him. I do believe that Dr. Sakella here has performed some aortic valve sparing operations himself. So how do you manage uh, a patient with uh, aortic regurgitation presenting for aortic valve replacement with respect to preload. Uh, although the Hensley suggests that they're somewhat more tolerant than aortic stenosis, uh, the uh, lesion um, is sensitive to uh, preload reduction and, and caution should be exercised. Heart rate is a little uh, different than for aortic stenosis and uh, in order to favor uh, forward cardiac output and uh, a, a smaller regurgitant fraction and a smaller LV size and a higher aortic diastolic pressure and a lower left ventricular ion diastolic pressure, a uh, higher heart rate with uh, 90 beats per minute is, being, is considered uh, contractility must be maintained according to Hensley's text and he they, the authors suggest um, milirinone or be pure beta agonists I would suggest that dobutamine would be a reasonable choice although if you wanted to use epinephrine uh, it, it, it would be quite acceptable. An opioid induction or perhaps a midazolam induction would be a reasonable choice uh, in um, aortic regurgitation. With respect to systemic vessel resistance, too much is bad, a little reduction is good. Premedication should be light. Induction maintenance can, uh, revolves around the titration of agents, the measurement of B2B blood pressure, and the uh, rational use of a pulmonary artery catheter. I want to bring to your attention that when you go on bypass, uh, there there may be uh, exacerbation of uh, aortic regurgitation and the left ventricle may distend and none of this may improve until the aortic cross clamp is applied. Weaning from cardiopulmonary bypass. You should remember that a chronically dilated and thinned left ventricle may lack adequate contractility to separate without inotropic support. Aortic regurgitation, the outcome of uh, surgery is felt to be better in, if it's done earlier. And this means that aortic valve replacement in asymptomatic patients is often recommended. Um, the uh, same guidelines uh, attempt to provide uh, cardiologists and surgeons with some indication of uh, how to proceed uh, based on um, the severity of the, uh, the lesion. For more details you should refer to a uh, practice guideline such as this. Now let's move along to subaortic resection for LVOT obstruction. Classically, this is due to hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Dynamic obstruction of the LVOT is due to SAM, and this is also associated with mitral regurgitation. Therefore, the symptoms of this uh, condition are dyspnea due to left atrial uh, pressure and decreased exercise tolerance due to low cardiac output. As you are all probably aware, patients with hypertrophic 
obstructive cardiomyopathy at, are at high risk of sudden death due to ventricular dysrhythmias. The goals of hemodynamic management can be summarized in that the preload should be kept up, the heart rate should be kept down, contractility should be decreased, and this is uh, easily done with uh, volatile agents, and systemic vascular resistance should be maintained. The important points from Hensley with respect to premedication would be to maintain uh, beta blockers, maintain beta blockade, induction, you would want to avoid decreases in SVR or increases in heart rate, which uh, would favor uh, a balanced technique. Uh, maintenance of anesthesia, uh, uh, as I just mentioned, can include uh, the use of uh, myocardial depression with volatile agents. And these patients may well be quite sensitive to uh, loss of uh, atrial contraction, sinus rhythm, so beware of dysrhythmias. When it comes to resection of the septum of the uh, heart, the ventricular septum, too little resection leaves residual obstruction. Too much resection can create a VSD and heart block. So the surgeon has a very challenging uh, lesion condition to treat. We can help by uh, confirming the diagnosis and ultimately uh, perhaps uh, with some um, uh, provocative maneuvers answer the question is the surgery successful and it is not unheard of to have to go back on uh, cardiopulmonary bypass and uh, shave more um, muscle from the uh, left ventricular outflow tract. Now res with respect to um, transesophageal echocardiography and aortic valve surgery. The next few slides are, are to uh, to summarize the the reason we use echocardiography. And in aortic stenosis, it can be to confirm the diagnosis before uh, the surgery starts. TEE can be effectively used to demonstrate to the surgeon that there's been good de-airing of the left side of the heart as this is an open heart procedure. Left ventricular contractility can be assessed. The proper function of the valve and the measurement of the transvalvular gradient can be performed and ultimate and as and can the technique can rule out or rule in the presence of a paravalvular leak. Um, Paravalvular leaks are not rare. However, large paravalvular leaks um, early in uh, um, the uh, surgery, in the course of surgery, or in the operating room, are uh, undesirable. With respect to aortic regurgitation, TEE can also confirm the diagnosis. It can be used to detect left ventricular distension. Um, particularly as you go on bypass. Uh, effective de-airing of the left side of the heart can be uh, 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 assured and uh, as with uh, the uh, previous slide, proper prosthesis function and gradient and uh, parapositic leak can be um, determined. This is the end of this podcast. Uh, 24 minutes and 18 seconds, and I thank you for your attention.